This is Jason Dacey on the road, rediscovering my homeland of Australia. Stories and interviews from the land down under. I'm with award-winning, best-selling, much acclaimed author, Michael Robotham, who's just released a new book. Good to see you again, Michael. It's been a while. We used to be colleagues, I should point out. Yeah, it's been, I, we've got to count it up. It's been more than 30 years, Jason. Yeah, it's, I think, at least 30, 35 years. We'll talk more about how we know each other a bit later on. And we'll also talk about how you had a quadruple heart bypass operation. And it's a miracle that here you are at the age of 58, that you're sitting in front of me because you had a dice with death just, uh, uh, you know, maybe a year or so ago. We'll talk about that more. But tell me about your new book. It's called Good Girl, Bad Girl. It's a psychological thriller. It's the start of a new series. Um, uh, I have created sort of two characters who I adore, one in particular, a very troubled teenage girl called Evie Cormack, who I think is probably the best character I've ever written. Um, she was found hiding in a secret room where a man had been tortured to death six years ago and uh, refused to reveal her name when she was discovered. So nobody managed to identify her through all the DNA testing. Uh, until sort of six years later, she's still in her children's home uh, and she's applying to be released. And a young psychologist called Cyrus Haven is sent in to interview her and to decide if Evie Cormack is ready for the world. But what he really has to decide is if the world is ready for Evie Cormack because she's a remarkable young woman. Well, your books are, are fantastic. I've read uh, several of them. Your characters are very dark and there are many different twists and turns. But this is a bit of a departure, isn't it? It's something different to what you've been doing. Uh, is it 14th book? I was trying to think. I think it's the 13th, although someone said it was the 14th the other day, and I'm thinking I must be terrible at counting. I think I'm writing too, for too long when, you've, when you lose count of... Uh, I mean, they're supposed to be like your babies, aren't they? You don't forget how many children you have. But it's either 13 or 14. Yeah, and, um, you know, tell us a bit more about um, Good Girl, Bad Girl, because uh, it's getting a lot of uh, attention you know, media-wise, uh, not just here in Australia, but also internationally. And uh, we know that some of your books have been turned into movies and TV series. Um, but what about, you know, a little bit more about what we can expect, and you know, especially for our Southeast Asian listeners who want to go and buy one? Yeah, this one, is, it's quite a dark book, and I guess it's the... Um the mystery is, I mean, Evie Cormack, the reason I think she's remarkable is that she can tell when someone is lying. She's what's known as a, a truth wizard, and that's not something out of Harry Potter. Um, they do exist. Um, there are people in the world that can tell when someone is lying. Uh, often they've come out of professions like the police force or the prison service or child services where they're lied to every day and they can therefore, they can start picking when people are lying to them. Evie Cormack has had such a violent terrible terrible childhood where she's had to pretty much to decide from one moment to the next whether someone was going to hit her or hug her so she's developed this unique ability to tell when someone is lying and it when I say it's unique it is a complete curse because you have to just imagine for a moment we lie all the time to each other to maintain relationships to maintain friendships we tell people that their new hair style is great and my bum doesn't look big. <laughs> Your bum doesn't look big in that dress. You know, um, you know we, we, we lie and say, I'm five minutes away. I only had one beer. I bought it on special. I mean, these are the simple little lies we tell. But what a curse it would be if we knew every time someone was lying to us. I'm with uh, award-winning, best-selling uh, author Michael Robotham in Brisbane, where he's on a book tour across Australia. And, of course, his book, uh, Good Girl, Bad Girl, is coming out, and uh, people can uh, can buy that. But let's go back to the beginning, Michael, because you and I worked together many, many years ago uh, in, in a news organisation, John Fairfax and Sons. <laughs> Sounds very old-fashioned now, doesn't it? And you were, uh, I think, you were around a year older than me. You were a year ahead of me. You were, you were a journalist on the Sydney Sun. Did you ever imagine when we were both young cadet journalists, as they were called in Australia then, did you ever imagine that you'd be a best-selling author? No, it's funny. I mean, I, I wanted to be a writer from a really young age. I mean, I grew up in very small country towns in, in Australia. And I, I wanted to be a writer from about the age of 11 when I read the works of Ray Bradbury, you know, a very mm -hmm. famous writer who wrote Fahrenheit 451. Yeah. We studied and, at school, didn't we? Exactly. And uh, I wrote a letter to him when I was 11 years old. And I, I don't re recall putting a stamp on the envelope, but I, I put it in a post box in my little country town. And three months later, I came home from school to find a package containing the three books that weren't available in Australia. And a letter from Bradbury himself saying how thrilled he was to have a young reader 
on the far side of the world. And I sort of feel as though I became a journalist to gather material because I grew up in very small country towns and I feel as though Mark Twain had written all the best plots, you know, and I had nothing to write about. Um, And so I became a journalist and, you know, like you, we became cadets. It was very hard to become a cadet journalist. Mm. Ever since Woodward and Bernstein had had, uh, had broken Watergate, every man and his dog wanted to be a journalist. Um, and you and I, yeah, we were one of the last people to take, go into journalism straight out of school, straight out of high school. And here we are in our late 50s. It's hard to believe, you know, 35 years have passed since we were last uh, sitting face to face here. But I, something very dramatic happened to you last last year, I believe. And, you know, you look, I'm looking at you, you look fit, uh, you look healthy, you know, not carrying any excess weight. But you were on the brink of dying and you had a quadruple bypass heart operation. I know a lot of people listening out there probably think you know, this would never happen to me but you could really not be be alive now was, you were very very close to dying yeah and it came as a complete shock because i had no symptoms whatsoever um um unbeknown to me it it's in my family i mean i had no idea it was in my family I, that genetically i was um predisposed to having a heart condition but you know i have a resting heart rate of 48 i, I exercise I eat a good diet i'm not overweight and I didn't have a single symptom, but I had a GP who just said, oh, I'll go and do this test. And it was like an exercise ECG on a treadmill. Um, that was inconclusive, but they decided just to do one more test. And they discovered that I had one artery 100% blocked and one 98% blocked and one 46% blocked. And they wouldn't let me get off the table because they thought, we can't work out why you're still here because you're, the left-hand side of your heart is getting 2% blood flow. And it wasn't until the surgeon arrived that she said that she told me that my one good working artery was forcing blood under my heart to keep me alive. So my heart had changed itself to keep me alive. Um, You know, and so I'm very, I mean, I could have dropped and I wouldn't have survived the heart attack. I would have just dropped and died on the spot. So very fortunate. With uh, acclaimed author Michael Robotham just releasing uh, Good Girl, Bad Girl. It's his 14th novel we think could be 13th but he's written a lot and uh, he's much acclaimed uh so how did that change your perspective on things Uh, because you know you're a proud dad you know one of your daughters is very successful as a music producer and and writer i mean you've had so much success but how does it change your perspective it's interesting initially you know I, i people said oh you must have felt like a new man um and and because i physically didn't have any symptoms i didn't feel I didn't feel any different, but it gave me oh, this massive sort of shock, I suppose, it's that I'd brush with, you know, mortality where, you know, you suddenly decide I'm not going to put things off, you know. I mean, that that trip to Africa, like I took a trip to Africa, you know, went back there this year and, you know, that that desire to just sort of see as much of my children and see as much of the world and, you know, I, I'm not going to stop writing books because it's what I love, you know, love doing, but... I think I'm going to try to um, embrace life and just sort of look at the colours and just stop. You know, I saw a beautiful, beautiful sunrise this morning um, from up in Mullaney, up in the mountains, you know, west of, uh, northwest of Brisbane. And it was just, I just sort of sat, I just sat there in awe of this amazing sunrise and thought, I've got to do this more often. Let's talk more about, you know, your journey into becoming an author. And, you know, the two of us were young cadet journalists. We were in a hurry. We were brash. We thought we knew everything. We were teenagers and, uh, you know, we we're working in Sydney. And both of us made journeys uh, to London, you know, at a fairly young age in our early 20s, or early to mid-20s. And, you know, you went to Fleet Street and, and then you had success working for some of the big papers of Britain. But what I, or intrigued me was you became a ghostwriter for famous people, including... Ginger Spice, Jerry Halliwell, right? Yeah. What was that like? Yeah, it's interesting, I suppose, having been, having never lost that desire to be a novelist, and yet, you know, I'm sure you, you, you know, we were both seduced, seduced by journalism. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's an amazing profession that you can travel the world and, and report on sort of, you know, historic events, you know, life-changing events. But I never, ever lost the desire to, to be, you know, a novelist. And but I, I, I then began to wonder if I had the patience or the discipline because as a journalist, you're, only, you're always writing you know, 800 words or 1,000 words or doing, you know, a, a small segment, you know, to camera. And, and so I thought ghostwriting might teach me if I have that discipline. And I, and I met a ghostwriter when I was working on Fleet Street. 
I didn't know, know they existed. I didn't know that that famous people had sort of ghostwriters. And um, and so I thought, okay, this is the next step. Let's let's see if I have the discipline. So, you know, I said Jerry Hallowell of the Spice Girls, Lulu, the '60s pop star, mm-hmm. you know, to serve with mm-hmm. love. Um, you know, Dennis Thatcher. You know, I mean, there were some remarkable people that uh, that I wrote for in the end. But I I think the the magic of ghostwriting and what it taught me was a ghostwriter has has to ca- these are their books these are their autobiographies so i had to capture their voice so perfectly that people that had known them their entire lives would not recognize my fingerprints on that story so it was that ultimate job it's almost like being a portrait painter and you start but you have to use their brush strokes and paint paint them with their skills it's a different art, isn't it? And I mean, like you, I think I'm a, I'm very nosy. I love hearing people's stories, and I want to know what makes them tick, and I want to know every detail and every date. I think it's just part of you know who we are as journalists. But you'd already written a novel in a great Australian novel, as they say, that never was accepted. But then, I think around 2002 or so, you you kind of went into the the crime writing genre, which is my favourite genre. Um, I love reading that kind of stuff, including your books. So, how did you make that? leap you know from being a ghostwriter to being a successful crime novelist i was in in between projects um i just finished a ghostwritten book and, and i'd been told in three months time actually it was the book lulu the, the autobiography of lulu was coming up and I, and I was asked if i'd do that and i had this window of three months and i wrote 117 pages of um of a novel which i had no idea was a crime novel um and it it triggered a bidding war at the London Book Fair in 2002. And by then I was back, I'd moved back from London to live in Australia. I was living in Sydney and the phone was ringing at three o'clock in the morning from my UK agent saying that there were five American publishers bidding and four German publishers bidding and the, the French had offered this and the Italians offered this. And in the space of three hours, it was translated into more than 20 languages. And I think it's now into sort of 27, including quite a number of Asian languages. Um, and uh, I mean, it was the most, I mean, every dream I'd, I'd ever had came true in that sort of three hour period. You don't go to sleep after something like that. And by 7.30 in the morning, my wife and I were still awake looking at the ceiling, by which time we'd spent the money, you know, and by eight o'clock we'd cast the Hollywood film. And by 8.30, the terror set in thinking, oh my God, these people think I can write a novel and I don't know how it ends. But I mean, it was the most astonishing way to start my career. It really was, you know, and I remember, you know, I was in the US, I think, not long after that, and I was, I was working over there. I remember walking into a bookstore in, in uh, New York City and I'm seeing, like, Michael Robotham displayed there as a novel, and I'm like, is that the same guy? <laughs> <laughs> so I kind of did a double take and I looked it up, and, of course, you lose contact. You know, we were, we were colleagues, you know, 30 years, years and plus ago, and here you are, you know, being um, brandished in a, you know, in a New York City uh, Manhattan bookstore. But what intrigues me too is how German um, readers and TV viewers have really taken to your work. They love it. And, and you've got the TV series and films from that. Tell us about that. Yeah, the Germans, I, don't, I can never quite understand why, but of all the markets in the world, Germany has been phenomenal. It's the only place, I mean, I, I go to where I get an inkling of what it's like to be a rock star. I mean, I'm due to go to Germany in, um, in October and... And there'll be people waiting at my hotel when I get there. And um, and normally when I do an event in Germany, 700 people will show up. And they've made, I think the sixth film is just about to be shown on German TV. Um, I've just had a, a, a book called The Secret She Keeps. They've just wrapped up filming a six-part TV series, which they're, which is actually set in Australia. They've, they've moved the action from from uh, London to, to Sydney. Um, and 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 I guess the other other major sort of film news is that I've just signed a deal, a company called World Productions, who made a wonderful BBC series called The Bodyguard and Line of Duty, mm. have just bought um, the rights to my Joe O'Loughlin series. So um, I've seen The Bodyguard on on Netflix. That's it's a re- terrific. It's a terrific drama. And Line of Duty is a, mm. I think a tenant's fourth series now. They're terrific, mm. terrific dramas. And so I mean, you never hold your breath. Um, with these things, I mean, I know, I mean, a few are, have actually been made. I know when I first, my first ghost written book was a book called 
Empty Cradles, uh, the story of Margaret Humphreys, a, a social worker from England who uncovered the child migrant scandal where 150,000 British children were cleared out of children's homes and sent all around the world from about 1850 to 1968. That took 19 years to be made into a film called Oranges and Sunshine. So, <laughs> wow. you know, it was option the moment I wrote it in, the, in about 1997, and it took 19 years to make it to the screen. Well, I've seen on social media, you know, Stephen King, you know, giving you glowing praise uh, for your latest book. And one of my heroes uh, of crime writing is Michael Connolly, uh, who you, you know, friends with and hang out with. So we're all envious. Uh, but, you know, your your talent and skill has taken you a long way. But I guess w- what I'd want to know is, you know, what's going to be the next thing for you? You know, what, are you just going to keep going as you are, or especially knowing what you've gone through with your health scare? Yeah, it's, it's an interesting one. I think... You know, I would like to do. I, 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 for the first time, I have been involved in in the the TV drama that's just finished filming. Maybe I'll get a little bit more involved in in that side of things. But you know, I think, I think I'd probably. I've been writing a book a year pretty much for the last fourteen years, and and um, and I think at some point I'd like to sort of pull back and maybe do a book every two years. But one of the things that's taught me this being involved in film is, I love being a writer because you know, as a as a crime writer, I'm. I'm this godlike figure where I decide what happens. And once you start working in film and TV, you've got networks and producers and directors and actors and foreign distributors, and they're all trying to tell you what they think they should do. And mm. I like the fact that um, I'm in control. So when might we see you in Southeast Asia? Because you have a lot of fans in, in Singapore and, and Malaysia, and you travel so much. I'd love to. Look, a couple of times I've been invited to writers' festivals um, there, and I haven't. It's never. It's always corresponded with when I'm already on tour of somewhere else. But I'm looking forward to 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 getting into getting up there to some of those sort of Southeast Asian festivals because uh, it's a part of the world that I love, you know, and I love travelling there. But I've never actually gone up there with my writer's hat on. Well, Michael, uh, what a treat it is to, to see you again after 35 years and to know that you survived your health scare and the way that you know our lives have turned out from being those young, brash with the, in reporters with the bad hairstyles and the bad fat ties. Huh? And we haven't changed a bit, have we? <laughs> <laughs> not a bit, not a bit. This has been Jason Dacey on the road in Brisbane, Australia. Michael, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure.